How are you this morning? Excellent. Um, I'm glad you're with us. Um, we're talking about this, this series. Called, it's called Christmas List. And uh, lists are actually uh, important to help us remember what we want to remember. Now, I know that Matt, uh, last week, uh, he came and preached, and I don't think that he's a list guy. On the other hand, I am a list type of guy, okay? I have all kinds of lists. I love lists uh, because it helps you accomplish what you need to accomplish, and it helps you remember important things so you don't forget them. But lists don't only help you remember things, they also help you remember people. This morning, I want you to think about, about this, uh, about your favorite celebrations. I don't know what your favorite celebrations are. For some of you, maybe Christmas. If your favorite celebration is Christmas, just raise your hand. Okay, so for some of you, right, you love the Hallmark movies, you love the, the Christmas trees. Yeah, exactly. All the guys are like, no, no, I don't love the Hallmark movies. It's like once you watch one, you've watched them all, right? Uh, exactly. I, I got an amen over there, I think. Uh, good. Uh, but uh, you may love Christmas. For some of us, it's like birthdays, right, or weddings. You just love going to weddings and seeing everybody so happy. You know, for some of us, it may be just the birth of a son or a daughter or graduations or victories in sports. I don't know what your favorite celebration is, but uh, I want you to know that there are some things in common in every celebration. Uh, one is the joy and the festivities that happen, the laughter that can happen. And the other one is the people that you love are usually there with you. The people that matter to you are usually joining with you in those moments. And here is why. Because, uh, it, it, here's, here's why. Because our greatest events are celebrated, not solemnized. And I'm going to go into why I believe that here in a minute. But and they're spent with others, not alone. Our greatest events are always celebrated. In, in other words, the celebration is more important than ceremonies. They're not ceremonial. And yeah, there is a ceremony to the wedding. But I, I can guarantee you that very few of you remember what the pastor said at your wedding. Like all, everything that he preached about. But what you remember is the vows. Maybe beyond that, you know, the funny thing that happened at the party, right? Or you remember that one time, that, the, the dance that you had with your dad or with your mom. Or, you know, if you were the one getting married. The things that you remember are relating always to people, not to the ceremonial side of it. In fact, that's why if, you know, the people that have asked me to, to marry them, and I have a couple of them here, it's like, you know that my ceremony was short, sweet and short, because I'm like, no one wants to listen to me at a wedding, okay? Everybody's just waiting for me to just say, I declare you husband and wife, and now let's go celebrate and party, right? Christmas, I think, unfortunately, has been turned from a celebration into a uh, just a ceremonial, you know, type of event where we become very picky, where it's more about, you know, just the gifts and the food and the, the setting being perfect and just having this, like, picture-perfect, you know, event. And that, instead of bringing joy and celebration, guess what it brings? Stress and just, you know, heartache at times when we can't get what we want. And so one of the things that I want you to do is, is I want this event, which is, you know, the greatest event that God came to earth to be joyful this year for all of us. How can we do that? By inviting others to celebrate Jesus with you. And so here's what I want you to do this season. This season, invite others to celebrate Jesus with you. Now, I, I, want, I want to emphasize that I didn't say necessarily celebrate Christmas because Christmas is any more like a cultural thing. But celebrate Jesus with you. 
We need to remember this Christmas season to, to help others celebrate Jesus with us. God was the first person that actually invited others to celebrate Christmas with them. And, and these people that he invited, he invited, and he didn't care about the setting. He didn't care about the timing. He didn't care about their comfort, which oddly enough are all the things that we care about, aren't they? Like we care about the setting. How many of you, uh, when you host Christmas at your place, the first thing that you feel is like this weight on you? It's like, oh man, we're going to have Christmas. I'm going to have to clean. I'm going to have to finish a project that I have. I'm going to have to, you know, just decorate. I'm going to make sure that, you know, it's child-proof. And instead of feeling joy, you feel this weight on you because we're so worried about the setting. You know what? God invited through the angels, invited these guys, the shepherds, and we're going to read about it here in a minute. You know that he invited them to a cave that worked as a stable probably or a tower that worked as a stable. Do you know that? Like that was the first Christmas celebration. Like there are no decorations. It stunk. It like, smelled like sheep and other animals. That was the setting. Okay, so maybe you can stop worrying about the way that your house smells this Christmas, okay? And be like, okay, I can have people over. It's fine. You know, we worry about the timing, right? How many of you have more than one Christmas dinner this year? And you're like, man, every time we have more than one Christmas dinner, like we have to like, schedule it's like you get the calendar out, and your wife gets the calendar out, and everybody, and you try to work it out. And there's maybe an argument or two about where we're going to spend what, and how long, and how we're going to travel from one place to another. You know, when God invited the shepherds for the very first time, it was in the middle of the night. It's like he didn't care about the timing of it. He just woke him up. Uh, he just said, hey, my son has been born today. Go see him. And, and the last thing that we, you know, worry about sometimes is comfort. You know, we try to find gifts. Did you realize that there, there's been a couple of statistics, one in tw from 2015 and one from 2018 that I found, that says that the number one cause for stress for parents during Christmas season is finding gifts. Finding gifts is the number one stressor for people. And, and we just care about the comfort. You know, the, the, the third stressor was cooking for the holiday, cooking during the holiday. And, and I tell you what, man, we spend so much time on these things that we forget that it's not about the, the timing or the setting or the comfort or the gifts. It's really about the relationships that, that are important to us that we bring as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And so I want us to shift our focus. God's concern was for others to share in the joy of him saving humanity. And I think that needs to be our concern, that we share in the joy of celebrating with others that Jesus was born. He came to the shepherds. God came to the shepherds in the middle of the night, called them to a setting that was very humble and didn't care about their comfort. He had him go and just simply meet Jesus baby Jesus. And so, so here's what I want us to do this Christmas. I want us to forget about the to-dos, and I want us to prioritize people. In other words, you need to prioritize your invite list over your to-do list. You, you need to understand that who you spend Christmas with and who you spend Jesus, you know, just celebrating Jesus with is more important than what you get done. Now, um, when you make an invite list, you know, it's always difficult, right? We need to think about this because every time that you, you host an event, you have so many people that you want to have, but sometimes some people don't make it to it. So I want us to work on our invite list. And I want you to, to think, have you invited anyone to celebrate Jesus with you? And if you haven't, you know, this is what this message is going to be about because God picked a specific set of people to celebrate Christmas with them. And I want you to, to think about this. What would God say if you had a list of people that you want to invite to celebrate Jesus with you? Uh, would he approve of that list? Would there be someone who God would say, hey, you're missing someone here. Maybe it's a family member. And we're going to talk about that next week. You know, what happens when family just, uh, you know, don't get along well? What happens when there's been hurt in the family? We'll, we'll address that next week. But I also want you to think about the people that maybe you're not inviting 
to celebrate Jesus with you this, this season, this Christmas season. And so here's what I want to challenge you. This Christmas season, invite, first of all, those you think unlikely to listen. Those who you think are unlikely to listen. Let's open our Bibles in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And in Luke chapter 2, uh, we're told of, of the story of how our Savior was, was born. Um, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles as you came through the doors in the auditorium. Um, you, you can get one. Keep it if you don't have one. And if you have a smart device, just download the Bible app. Keep the Bible with you. Take some time to read it every day. Um, and it's going to change your life, I guarantee you. Um, here is what uh, I want you to, to just follow along with me as we read verses 8 and 9. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. On, on the outside, the shepherds were not probably the people to invite to the first Christmas. Right? Sometimes looks can be deceptive, though. Because even though uh, probably the shepherds wouldn't have been your first choice or my first choice to invite to, to see Jesus, it was God, they were God's first choice. And what if I told you that God had a specific plan for inviting them to Christmas, to the first Christmas? Because let's continue to read there in verse uh, 12. So he says, This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The sign was to be that the baby would be wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And uh, one thing that I want you to think that, you know, I don't want you to, to get wrong like I did for many years, is that I thought that he just meant like, Cloths meant like clothes, like yeah, it's right. He's got clothes, or he's got you know these clothing that he's wrapped in, or it's not like a diaper or anything like that. Why? Because that was supposed to be the sign. So for the longest time, when I didn't know that, I I always wondered like how is that a sign that the baby was wrapped in in cloths, like that every baby is wrapped in in some type of clothing, right? So that's not what what it was. Um, in fact, um, for, because I didn't know what, these, like, what this sign meant, uh, for the longest time I wondered what the shepherds did. And I thought, man, they went to Bethlehem, to this little village of about 600, and they woke everybody up. They were knocking until they found Jesus. And I kind of commended the shepherds. But what I was missing, I was missing one piece of information about these cloths um, and why that was a sign. As it turns out, these shepherds more than likely were Levitical shepherds. Now, what does that mean? Okay, remember, Jerusalem is about like four, three, four miles north of Bethlehem. It's like Troy and Moscow Mills, right? So they're not that far. And Bethlehem provided a lot of the sheep for the sacrifices in Jerusalem. And if you want to know the numbers, it's like probably about a quarter of a million sheep a year. Like that's like the big business in Bethlehem was like, you know, taking care of sheep, raising them so that the males could be used, like a one-year-old, they needed one-year-old males to, that were, had no defect to be able to be offered a sacrifice in the temple for the, for the, for the rituals that they had in place, you know, in the, in the law of the Old Testament. And so what would happen is that in the area of Bethlehem, uh, there was one place specifically called Migdal Eder, which meant Tower of the Flock. The t- this Tower of the Flock would be Something that looks like this. So this is Bethlehem and Magdala. There would be right here, right like on the north edge of Bethlehem. And it would be a place that looked kind of like that. It was a tower. Whether it was partly like a cave and then it was built on on, on top a little bit. Or it was just man-made. We don't know. But in fact, in the book of Genesis, it, we, you know, it's talked about there. That was where Rachel was born. Uh, was, was buried, I'm sorry. And then um, it was a place where shepherds could kind of watch the hills from a safe place. That's also if there was a beast that overcame them, they would run to this place and, you know, hide there. Um, but uh, that's like a tower 
where they would watch over their flocks. And, and there was a specific place in Jerusalem, in, in Bethlehem called Migdal Adair, you know, the, the, the tower of the flock. And, and that's where th- these shepherds would wrap, any time that a lamb was born, they would wrap him in these specific cloths. By the way, that word is specifically used for that purpose. They would wrap them so that they wouldn't hurt themselves. They wouldn't have any blemishes. And they would carry them swaddled into this place to keep them safe, to, to be inspected. And so then another shepherd would come and inspect them, make sure they didn't have any flaws. And if they didn't have any flaws, then they were good to be raised for the sacrifice. 250,000 of these. So they were used to doing that. They take a, a, a lamb is born. Wrap them, swaddle them in, in cloths, in the, this word cloths that is used here twice only in the Bible. And then they take him to Migdalit there. And, and then there they inspect them and then they're good for the sacrifice. And I'm going to tell you, like, this, this just blows my mind, right? Because what happens is that the shepherds are on the hill, hills of Bethlehem. And it says that, you know, the, the angels appear and they tell them, today a Savior has been born. Here's your sign. You're going to find him lying in a manger. There were mangers there. And wrapped in cloths like a lamb. So how do they know? And so then let's, let's keep reading what happens next. So what happens next is, um, you know, once, verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone to, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. How did they find him? How did they find him? Because they knew exactly the place where they were supposed to go. They were supposed to go to Magdal Adair, to this specific place where Jesus would be lying in, in, in a manger with the cloths that they were used. Now, there's a prophecy in Micah 4, 8. And here's where it says, that as for you, watchtower, that word in Hebrew is migdal, of the flock, it there, the stronghold of Dar Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. And many scholars think that uh, this is what it means, that the Jesus more than likely was born in a place like what we show you. Now the place in the picture is not the original, but this was a picture taken in the 1920s after World War II. A lot of these places were knocked down, were destroyed. But, but this archaeologist took a picture of that. But there were places like that in existence for a long, long time. And, and it was probably at this place, Magdala, there, where Jesus could have been born. And it was at this place where the shepherds knew exactly where to go. And you know what? What's amazing to me is that these shepherds were called by God, by God to inspect the Son of God. To make sure he didn't have any, you know, flaws. Because he would become one day the Lamb of God that would wipe away the sin of the world. And so, what sometimes seems unlikely, like, you know, these guys that are just on the fields, God chose to be almost like a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God that Jesus would become in his ministry. And I tell you what, sometimes looks are deceiving And I can tell you, in your life, there are people that you think, man, so-and-so would never listen to the Lord. Would never listen to my invitation to, to, you know, come to church with me. Would never listen about, you know, the message of Jesus. And I can tell you, over and over again in the Bible, we see people that are unlikely to receive the message that received it. And the people that were likely to receive it did not receive it. So don't take it for granted. This Christmas season, what I want you to do is I want you to invite someone you think is unlikely to listen. And simply say, hey, I don't know, you know, exactly how much you know about Jesus, but I would love for you to, you know, just kind of come with me to church. And maybe that can spark a conversation. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you know them a little better and you can literally just talk talk to them about Jesus and who the Lord is. But just think about that. The shepherds were unlikely people, but God had something in mind. He was foreshadowing who Jesus would become and and had them go check on him. Here's something else. Someone else you can invite to Jesus uh, this this season, to, to celebrate Jesus this season. Yourself. 
you don't forget to be a seeker first, okay? This season, you need to make sure that you allow yourself to continue to be a seeker. Let's go back to verse 15 of uh, Luke 2. Verse 15 and 16 says, When the angels had left him and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Now, here's, here's what's that's interesting to me. They said, let's go. Let's go and see. The shepherds didn't stand around. And, and that's something that I think, man, we need to learn from them. You know, one of the biggest downfalls about Christianity in the, in the 21st century is this. That we have learned to be okay going through the motions but doing nothing about the things that we hear. It's like you, you know, we have so many resources, right? You can probably listen to a sermon 24-7 for the rest of your lives, and there are enough sermons on the internet for you to listen. But the problem is that that's not what we need. What we need is to hear God's word and then do something about it. In fact, Lord Jesus, when he talked about the man who built his house on the rock, wasn't that one who heard the sermons who went to church, is the one who heard God's word and did it, put it into practice. And and one of the things that we fail to do is just that, to put it into practice. So we need to learn to do that. We need to respond. I uh, printed this quote from Henry Blackaby's book, uh, Knowing God. And I want you to just listen to what he has to say about this, okay? He says, many people have grown up attending church and hearing about God all their lives, but they do not have a personal, dynamic, growing relationship with God. There are far too many people who settle for practicing a sterile religion rather than enjoying a growing, vibrant, personal relationship with the living God. Baptism, worship attendance, and church involvement are all appropriate. Obedient responses to our relationship with God, however, they do not create or replace the relationship. Many people want God to call them to a big assignment. However, they try to bypass the love relationship. The love relationship is why God created you. That is far more important to Him than what you do. So anticipate that God will start working with you and drawing you to an intimate love relationship that is real and personal. When the love relationship is right, God will be free to be, uh, begin giving you assignments at His initiative. Whenever you do not seem to be receiving assignments from God or hearing from Him, focus on the love relationship and stay there until the assignment comes. God always has fresh and deeper truth. He wants us to learn about Him. You know, it's not about the rituals. It's not about solemnization of Christmas, about making it happen through a ceremony. It's about the relationship that we have with the Lord. So we need to allow ourselves this Christmas to experience that. If you assume that you know it already, you're going to miss him. And so do what the shepherds did and go check it out. Here's the the third type of people I want you to invite to, uh, to, to, to celebrate Jesus with you this Christmas season. Those already close to Jesus. Those who are already close to Jesus. So verses 16 and 17 Uh, say this, that they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. So they found Joseph and Mary. And and I think one of the things that we forget many uh, about biblical characters and about the people that we hear and read about in the Bible is that they didn't have it all figured out at the time. Like we are getting basically, you know, an edited version of what happened then and we know what's going to happen but they didn't. So can you imagine uh, Joseph and Mary? And and we'll talk a little bit about their family relationship next week. But right now, I just want you to to know, it's like, man, they've been given a lot in a short period of time. And now they are charged with raising, you know, God's kid in in a lost and wounded world. And and we have to remember that they didn't know it all. So when, when God sends the shepherds to foreshadow what Jesus would do, Now, all of a sudden, they are also encouraged. And listen to what Mary did in verse 19. It says, But Mary treasured, when the shepherds showed up, 
and spread the word about what, what the angels told them about Jesus, they, she treasured up all these things and pardoned, pondered them in her heart. She treasured everything that was coming her way. And I'll tell you what, uh, here's a tip that we can learn from Mary. Take time to ponder, you know, the things that God is doing in your life during this season uh, right now. Just take time to ponder a little bit. And uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like he's doing much. Sometimes it doesn't feel like you're growing much. But I tell you what, just stay in there. You know, keep seeking God through this time, through this season. And I know it's hard for some of us. Uh, there is also a sense of loss for some of us. There is a sense of joy throughout, and it goes back and forth. But through it all, just stick with it and, and keep seeking God. Um, sometimes you can be with a lot of people and at the same time feel lonely. And people that are close to Jesus already can also experience this. Uh, something that I don't share very often um, is when I was in in college learning, trying to learn English. I came here when I was 19. And so I, I was actually just talking to some people this morning uh, I took two years of English, and then I switched to a different language. I switched to French in high school. So I didn't know very much English when I came. And even though I had some of my classes translated, there was a special program, uh, exchange program, uh, I still, you know, it was really difficult. And I was studying, and I was, like, trying to translate everything and trying to learn the language. I was taking a class, and, and it was very difficult. And it seemed like it doesn't matter what I did. I would find myself you know, just around the table with some other guys, and everybody would laugh, and I would just kind of smile, because I didn't know what was happening, and I would just, you know, it, it was difficult during that season, it was like from August to like January, for like five months of really not understanding much, but one of the things that I didn't realize at the time is that it seems like you're not learning the language, in fact, I almost quit, I almost said, man, I don't know that I'm going to be able to learn, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to probably go back home and do something else. And, and I remember there was a guy, his name is Garland, and he, he kind of took time to, to listen, and he took time to talk to me, even though it was very difficult. Have you ever tried to talk to someone who doesn't speak your language? Yes, it's very difficult, and it's awkward, right? It gets really awkward really fast. He took that time. And I tell you what, I really appreciate the fact that he encouraged me during this time when I was thinking about quitting. And that made a difference in my life. And, and what I didn't realize is that when you stick with it, you're actually learning. You just don't realize you're learning. Like learning a language has a threshold. And you can know so much and you still don't understand people. And all of a sudden, literally within one or two weeks, I started understanding like, what this person was saying and then what that person was saying. And all of a sudden, I could understand a lot of things. And here's what I want you to know. Sometimes our relationship with God is almost the same. It feels like Jesus speaks a different language. And like we can't hear him, we can't feel him, we, we don't know what he's doing in our lives. And I'm going to tell you, if that's you, you just need to stick with it and keep seeking him during this time. And, and here's the other thing. Maybe during this season you can encourage someone else that's close to Jesus already, but that's going through a hard time. That feels like he's not speaking Jesus' language. And you can just like Garland encourage me, you can say just, hey, stick with it. You know, you're going to get there. You know, you'll get there and, and, and just help them, you know, understand Jesus. Help them just uh, really explain and teach them in any way that you can, you know, Jesus. We need to think about those who are far and those who are close to Jesus. And here's the last group of people I want you to invite on this season. Anyone really got places around you. Here's what the shepherds did after they saw Jesus. Verse 17 and 18. When they had seen him. They spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I tell you, once you experience Jesus, you will be a witness of Jesus. Once you experience him, you'll want to talk to others about, about Jesus. So here's what, one thing I want you to do, and this is why we printed these for you. We want you to really be able to invite someone else. And you don't know, I don't know who... But I can tell you what, uh, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to grab a few of these as you walk out on your way out. And simply grab maybe like three or four and start like with the closest circles to you. Maybe someone, maybe for the longest time you haven't invited a family member, you know, to join you for Christmas. 
and, and maybe to, to come to church with you for Christmas and hear the message of the gospel. This, this uh, year, we're gonna, the, the message is called From the Cradle to the Cross. And what we're going to try to do is simply preach the message of the gospel through the message of Christmas. And, and I'm going to encourage you, invite people that haven't heard that message before. Maybe it's a family member. Bring him with you to one of the services. Maybe it's a co-worker or a neighbor. And maybe you grab a third one and, and you leave it for someone who God may put on your, you know, in front of you. You know, maybe a divine appointment that is, is there that you don't know about yet. And just use it then. Whatever it is, is be like the shepherds. These were people that decided once they saw Jesus, his message were, was worth spreading. Um, there was an 18-year-old uh, girl that went to a church in Washington State. And uh, they, she attended the service, and uh, she, you know, was kind of very quiet in the back. And at the end of service, you know, of course, like most churches, you know, she was asked to leave her information and should be contacted. <clears throat> and so someone from the church called her on, uh, on Tuesday, and uh, she, they had a very strange conversation. Uh, because she said, you know, I really enjoy the services. And she said, the pastor did a great job explaining the message of Jesus, uh, you know, the one you call Savior. She's, but I really don't know what to think about your church. And here's why. She said, uh, my parents just recently died. Uh, both of them died. And if what you're telling me is true, that means that both of them didn't know Jesus. And I don't know where they will be right now. But uh, she's like, here's what, what I don't know about you guys. is like, either what you're telling me is true and you don't believe it, or I'm missing something. Because we lived down the street from this church for the longest time, and we have never heard from you guys. And so what I want you to know is that people, if we, we believe it's true, if Jesus is who he says he is, and you believe it, we have to be compelled to invite him to, to Jesus, to know Jesus. We have to be compelled to go out and step out of our comfort zones and do something about it. And that's what I'm asking you to do this Christmas. To say, it's not just about the to-dos and what's for me and what's a you know, picture-perfect Christmas. It's about you know, what Jesus is really all about, about the Lamb of God. And so if you haven't done so, you still have time. That's a great thing. And you have time to, to, to talk to people about the Lord, to invite them to celebrate with us. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you, it can make a difference. Because maybe we need more than a list of gifts and to-dos. Maybe we, we need a list of people to invite that will actually bless us. And when you invite people to know Jesus now, maybe you will be on their list to thank you for that later. Uh, one of the things that I have a list. I told you that I love lists, don't I? Uh, when my mom passed away in, in March, uh, guys, there was an overpouring of love from our congregation to our family. And I, t I tell you, we got cards, we got food, uh, we got financial help in all kinds of ways. And, and so one of the things that I did is when I came back, I wanted to just sit down and, and take that in. And I knew that that was from the Lord, and so I took that in. So I decided to write a list of people. And I have written a list of people. Now, I have tried to thank most of you in one way or another. But I tell you, when we're in heaven, I have the list of all of you. And I'm going to ask my mom to make lunch for you, and we'll have you over for lunch, okay? <laughs> uh, and so I tell you, we, when you include people into a relationship with Jesus, when you invite them, you may end up on a list in heaven that will say, you know what, thank you for being courageous enough to invite me to know Jesus. And when you do that, I can guarantee you that we'll be celebrating in heaven so maybe you need that. You need that list. And if you haven't made it, I encourage you, write three or four people down this Christmas season and commit to saying, I'm going to invite them to celebrate Jesus with me. But maybe for you, uh, right now you're too stressed out to think about that. So here's what I want to close with uh, this morning. I want us to simply close with this thought that this Christmas season, uh, we need a Savior. We need a Savior that will save us from all the stress from all the weight of sin. We need a Savior that will save us from the hurt of the past.
from the sorrow of things that have happened, from the longing of things that we wish and, and things that we wish for and things that we, that we want. And, and I want us to hear verses 10 and 11 of this message that was given to the shepherds because they were thought worthy of the message. And, and I think that we can take this message as well. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this message that is worth sharing. And as we, Lord, each one has, I know, a group of people that haven't heard of you, Lord. There are 50,000 people, Lord, in this, in this town, in this county. And, and, Lord, I know that there are people that we know that need to know you. Let us, Lord, be compelled, Lord, be convicted, be encouraged by your Holy Spirit to, Lord, uh, find the right occasions to invite someone into our relationship with you, to find the grace that we have found. Lord, but let us, in the same time, just seek that grace during this season and, and be able to, Lord, uh, share this grace from the overflow that, of what you give us. And so I, I thank you and I praise you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.